Good evening. My name is Stephen Kenny, and I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources in the Penfield Central School District. It is my utmost pleasure to welcome you to Penfield's community conversation on promoting an environment free of harm and discriminatory language and practices. As you can see from our agenda tonight, we have a unique opportunity to learn from one another and grow as a school community. But before we get started, we must take a moment of silence to recognize the individuals whose lives were violently taken or forever changed by the horrific events in Buffalo and Uvalde. Our silence also allows us to reflect on the significance that today marks the second anniversary of George Floyd's killing. Please take a moment with me. Thank you. We commence tonight by framing our why for this evening's presentation and the work that we have been engaging in as a district. Our work is grounded in three New York State frameworks that are shared on this slide. Our conversation begins with the Culturally Responsive Sustaining Education Framework, otherwise known as the CRS. In January of 2018, the New York State Board of Regents directed the Office of P-12 Education and Higher Education to convene a panel of experts, engage with stakeholders, and develop from the ground up a framework for culturally responsive sustaining education framework. The CRS framework invites and engages P-12 stakeholders to work together to meet the diverse and unique needs of students and families within their communities. The CRS framework is designed to elevate student voices that have been oppressed and marginalized promote and engage students in positive outcomes and learning environments and empower them to think critically. In April of 2021, NYSED released the New York State Board of Regents Framework on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in New York Schools, a call, for act call to action, which launched an initiative to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion as a priority in New York schools. This call to action suggests that districts are responsible for elevating the longstanding issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, establishing data targets, setting policies, reviewing and modifying their curricula, amongst many things. In addition, it provides guidance for districts when implementing and sustaining diversity, equity, and inclusion elements. Lastly, in May of 2021, the New York State Board of Regents published a policy on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The policy encourages and supports efforts at the state and local level to create within every school an ecosystem of success that is built upon a foundation of diversity, equity, and inclusion, access, opportunity, innovation, confidence, trust, respect, caring, and relationship building. You can't argue with that. All students must feel that they are welcome, they belong, and they are supported in every school. These three documents anchor the work of our district. A little bit more about the culture sustaining education framework. The four principles that are guiding our work and serve as the district's priorities directly align to the four principles of the New York State Culture Responsive Sustaining Framework. As a district, we are committed to inspiring, acknowledging, embracing, celebrating, and learning about our community's diversity. These four prin principles are as follows. Welcoming and affirming environment, high expectations and rigorous instruction, inclusive curriculum and assessment, ongoing professional learning and support. I can't see, did I miss a slide? I got it, okay, thank you. This year, we have focused our district work on the principle of creating a welcoming and affirming environment. The New York State Education Department defines a welcoming and affirming environment as one that feels safe. It is a space where people can find themselves represented and reflected and where they understand that all people are treated with respect and dignity. The environment ensures all cultural identities, race, ethnicity, age, gender, sexual orientation, disability, language, religion, 
socioeconomic background are affirmed, valued, and used as vehicles for teaching and learning. This is evidence when following are in the, this is evidence when the following are in place. Collective responsibility to learn about student cultures and communities, close relationships with students and families, social emotional learning programs, materials that represent and affirm student identities. Thus, this evening we continue the work that we have done with our district leaders and faculty to emphasize how we as a district can demonstrate these actions and align our practices to ensure that all of our students experience a welcoming and affirming environment. I'd like to thank everyone that is here tonight and I have a long list that I'd like to review so please bear with me. I know that I'm long-winded but there are many thanks to recognize a night like tonight. So I'd like to thank those who helped out to make this evening possible. Thank you to the Penfield Central School Board of Education for all of your support and guidance. To Superintendent Dr. Putnam for his commitment and dedication to ensuring that all Penfield Central School District students feel welcomed and affirmed. Principal Leanna Watt for hosting this event this evening and for her planning with her building teams and stakeholders for the Student Community Building Day that includes presentations with Dr. Sean Eversley Bradwell. Guest speaker Sean Eversley Bradwell, thank you for his willingness to join us on our equity journey as we continue to work to improve each school and district school environment for all of our students. We'd like to thank our panel. We have some student panelists, Zipporah Sparkman, a 12th grader, and Leah Ormachea, a 10th grader. Family panelists, Ms. Jessica Kane and Dr. Shannon Cleverly Thompson. Faculty panelists, Ms. Amy Powers and Ms. Carmen Staub. Penfield graduates. Uh, Penfield graduates, now community partners, Mr. Justin Murphy and Mr. Zach Evans. Community partner, Maureen Mustafa George, Associate Director of Equity and School Services at the Children's Institute, serving this evening as our panel moderator. Nancy Bradstreet, Director of Communications for her efforts in sharing the importance of this event and making sure the community was invited to participate in this wonderful community conversation. We'd also like to thank Jason Fleming for his technical support for setting up this evening and PCTV also for their support and for recording this event. And if we missed you from that list, we apologize, but thank you very much. It is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Sean Eversley Bradwell. Dr. Bradwell is an assistant professor in the Department of Education at Ithaca College. Dr. Bradwell also serves as a faculty associate for Ithaca's MLK, King, MLK Scholars Program and has research in teaching interests in educational policy and social change. Dr. Bradwell, an alumnus of Amsterdam High School in New York, received a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of Rochester, a Master of Science in Education from Rochester's Warner Graduate School of Education in Human Development, and a PhD in Policy Analysis and Management from Cornell University. Throughout his career, Dr. Bradwell has worked in for-profit education, public schools, and higher education. In addition to his active research agenda and speaking schedule, Dr. Bradwell is also an active community member. He has been appointed to serve as a Tompkins County Heritage Ambassador, and he was recently elected to serve his fifth consecutive term on the Ithaca City School District Board of Education, where he also serves as the board's vice president. Spouse, parent, grandparent, sneaker collector, and part-time provocateur, Dr. Bradwell is committed to working towards more meaningful learning and teaching. Dr. Bradwell, we see you, we hear you, and you are definitely known in the Penfield community. Excitedly, I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Bradwell. There'll be a small transition, but we'll begin by saying good evening, good folks. I come from a different culture. Good evening, good folks. Oh, thank you for letting me know folks are there. Let's see if I can make a smooth transition here. Um, 
and we'll try to give a little bit of a experience about what we've been working with your students. Uh, I also like to move around, so I don't like podiums. I hope that's okay. I may come and sit next to you during the presentation. I hope that's okay as well. Um, and I tell folks I usually like to give um, any number of really, really bad jokes in a presentation. Uh, I'm going to try my best to, to keep those to a minimum. But I had the pleasure of being in Penfield uh, High School all day today. Uh, this is after a long journey working with uh, Tasha Potter, who's been absolutely amazing, uh, your Board of Education, uh, your Superintendent, Dr. Putnam, uh, the teachers at Penfield High School who have been more than gracious and welcoming. Uh, I was able to have meetings with the restorative practice team. I was able to have meetings with the Penfield High School DEI committee. And probably most importantly, I was able to have meetings with the Penfield High School Student Advisory Council. Um, all these meetings gave me a little bit more insight into the community, obviously, but much more importantly, what the students believed was needed for today. And so um, my acknowledgement of their uh, brilliance, their genius, their willingness to share um, sort of helps ground my work as, as well. Um, I said to this, one of the student groups this morning is I don't normally get nervous before talks, right? I mean, there's always some anticipation um, wondering who's going to be in the audience, right? You know, if I had to show up on the, the gram or Instagram somewhere, right? Whatever that may be. Um, but today was a difficult day. Uh, yesterday was a difficult day. So to wake up this morning and try to find the energy, try to find the uh, emotional fortitude to be able to engage in another difficult topic on top of some difficult weeks, on top of some difficult months, um, I asked the students if they would be kind and help uplift me, right, to help me provide the energy. And I was amazed by your students. Um, they were generous. Uh, they were engaged for the most part, right? They were engaged. Um, and it was really uh, uplifting to be in a space when we're trying to negotiate through so many things. Does that make sense, y'all? Yeah. I'm going to keep asking you all, does that make sense multiple times, so just get get ready for it, right? So that's sort of where we began. Um, and when I begin talks, I usually show sort of one of an image that's similar to this, with an understanding that um, my primary area of research and so-called expertise beyond sneakers, uh, I am definitely a sneaker collector, uh, much to my spouse's dismay, uh, I've now been told if I buy a pair, I have to get rid of a pair, and I don't know how to negotiate that equation, so you all can help me with that. Um, but I show this image, this graph, to talk about the ways in which we all come from a variety of experiences and a variety of identities, and that they often overlap and intersect. And so my experience as a black man is significantly different than my wife's experience as a black woman and trying to get our students to realize that we may share some identities, we may share religion, we may share economic status, we may share ability, and yet there's other things that we don't share. We may not share language, uh, we may not share geography, which is becoming more and more of a primary identity for a number of folks. And so to get our students to think about the ways in which we're not always one thing, and I will try the best I can to, even while I may use race as one of the primary examples, to please understand that this travels well beyond the idea and the concept of race, right? That that's not the only thing we're talking about, and particularly when we're talking about young people who are still trying to find their way in the world and understand who they are. So this image here helps demonstrate that for me, right? That some parts of my identity are much more prominent and other parts of my identity, while extremely impactful, may not carry the same amount of space in my day-to-day -day experience as well, right? So I always begin there. I also want folks to know it is possible that we may discuss, talk about, for me, spell out words that have the possibility to offend um, and or cause harm. Uh, if we're talking about the idea of harmful language, uh, primarily what I'll be discussing are the creation of various slurs, right? Gender slurs, sexuality slurs, religious slurs, racial slurs, that we have to do so with acknowledging the language itself. And I regularly say to groups, 
Um, if we can't have a conversation about difficult language um, in a classroom, and I consider this to be a classroom space, if we can't have conversations about difficult words in a classroom space, then I'm worried that we may not have a space to have these conversations. This is precisely the space that we should have these conversations, right? We should frame it. We should understand that we're trying to get to a better place. We're not just throwing words out randomly, but we still does not change the impact that it may have on some folks, and I'll be cognizant of that as well. Are you all still with me? Yeah. All right, fantastic. So um, I thought deeply about whether I was going to share this with students today, and I decided that it was essential to ground them in something, um, to ground them in the seriousness of what we experience. And so um, I, I show this slide in the next couple slides intentionally to get people to understand the importance and the power of names, names in particular. So I begin by saying I was born Sean William Bradwell. My mother is Irish. She named me after Sean Connery. And I, well, I know we're recording this. Mom, Sean Connery is Scottish. I apologize, <laughs> right? So if you all see her, you can let her know. William is named after my grandfather, and Bradwell is my father's last name. So I was asking students as well, I'm sure like folks in the audience, we carry names that have familial significance, named after a relative, named after uh, one of my students this semester, his name was Jordan, and when I asked him, I was like, why are you called Jordan? You know, why did you get named Jordan? He's like, my dad's a Chicago Bulls fan, <laughs> right? Of course he's gonna name me after Michael Jordan, right? And so there's ways in which names have significance, and we all carry that significance. We're, we're usually aware, particularly if it's named after a relative, we usually know some of the history of what that means. And so my spouse is in the audience. She doesn't like when I tell my version of the story, but I'm going to do it anyway, and I'll deal with this afterwards. First of all, talk about the way in which language is, is gendered. There is no male term for maiden name, right? My maiden name is Bradwell. My married name is Eversley Bradwell. My version of the story is my spouse came in a couple days before we were gonna get married and said, hey, I have an idea. You can be single and be Sean Bradwell, or you could be married and be Sean Eversley Bradwell. I took Eversley Bradwell, right? And I understand the reason and the importance of that as one of the last remaining Eversleys in her family did not want that name to go away, did not want that name to disappear. And I clearly understood the importance of that. So for me, it was not even a question. Absolutely, yes, I will be Sean Eversley Bradwell. What I want to share with you today is how my family got the Bradwell name. And so this is partly what I show folks. Um, this is a listing of the estate of John Bagels Sr., October 22nd in 1852, right? So this is the listing, and the listing includes things like how many plates and what was the value of those plates, right? How many hogs? Was there a plow, right? All the things that John Bagels owned that's part of the estate that was being evaluated and appraised upon his passing in October of 1852. This part right here, we can translate, and you can see it was appraised by his son, and part of what John Bagels owned was people. So the listing, Negroes, June, $300, Ginny, $100, Martin, $300, Peggy, $5, Lewis, $800, August, $375, Molly, $600, James, $600, Child, $500, Lizzie, $300, for a grand total of $4,380. Now I show this because my great-great-grandfather is listed in this appraisal, in this estimate of property. The estate of John Bagels, which was purchased by John Bradwell. John Bradwell owned the Bradwell Plantation in Goose Creek, South Carolina. And a part of his buying the estate of John Bagels included buying the humans, the people, 
the enslaved folks that you see here, which included my great-great-grandfather, who we colloquially knew as Junior, but is listed here as June. So that's important for me to recognize that when my students call me Dr. Bradwell, it's carrying weight, it's carrying history, it's carrying struggle, it's also carrying emancipation. Because upon emancipation, it was common, particularly in many southern states, but also in the north as well, when folks were emancipated, they took on the name of their owner. So June, who did not have a last name prior to 1865, after 1865 becomes June Bradwell. And that's the weight of the name that I wear. I, so for me, it's rooted in enslavement, but it's also rooted in emancipation, right? So that's part of my name, getting our young folks to also realize that names have importance, they have history. I also show this at times, that the total value of John Bagel's estate was $4,821.25. If we go back up one, remember the people that he owned was valued at $4,380, which means 91% of the wealth of this particular estate was in human chattel, was in human beings. That for me is a note that I I'm able to engage much more with my students when we're in class to have a conversation about what that means, but I don't like that to go unnoticed or uncommented upon. The other side of my family is last name is Smith. And this is an interesting story because I did not know about this story until I was in my 40s. My great-grandfather, and I tell students pretty regularly that my grandfather knew his grandfather. Are you all following that? My grandfather knew his grandfather. My grandfather knew his grandfather who was enslaved. Slavery is not as long ago as we sort of oftentimes want to imagine. But William Smith, who was in Maryland, ran on the Underground Railroad with the assistance of many people and abolitionists to Pennsylvania, to a small community called Montrose, Pennsylvania, created a community and a church there. There is a book that's written about it fought in the Civil War, right, was committed to this notion of liberty in the United States. When William got to Pennsylvania, he looked around and saw that a good majority of the folks that were in the area had the last name Smith and said, you know what? I'm going to choose my last name. So if you come looking for me, you're going to have difficult finding me. So on one hand, I have this experience of enslavement being the reason for my name. On the other hand, I have this reason of emancipation and liberation, but it reminds me of something my students say to me all the time, that there's power in given names and as much, if not more power, in chosen names. And so I usually try to focus on that. And so this was the introduction that I tried to provide today to get young folks to realize that words matter, right? That language matters that words carry with them a great deal of things that we have to sort of work our, our way through. So this is the introduction. I also wanted to get our young students to think about that language is an expression of thought. I normally say that how we think will dictate how we act, excuse me, the words we use will dictate how we think, and how we think will dictate how we act. So words matter. So the one example I gave is I remember being in graduate school and someone asked me to create my classroom management philosophy, right? It was part of my studies to create my classroom management philosophy. And I said, what if I created a classroom engagement philosophy? Still around notions of classroom management, but if my job is to engage students, then I have less to manage. I hope that part makes sense, right? That words matter in terms of what we do. But I also wanna know how do we get here, right? If language is an expression of thought, how did we even get to this idea of language and words? So prepare yourself, y'all. I'm going to show you all a picture. It's going to be tough for you all to take in. This is my granddaughter, Amari Nicole, who is wearing the name of her grandmother, Nicole, right? So this is Amari Nicole. 
I obviously am on some Apple spy device. We won't talk to Apple, we'll talk about them later. She is on my iPhone. There is a saying amongst linguists that our ancient ancestors could build tools before they could speak, right? We were building tools before we can speak. This young one here was able to find her YouTube videos before she uttered a word, right? She knew what symbols to push to be able to find her LOL doll videos, right? But that's profound for me, that you have an experience where someone is able to negotiate this device without being able to utter a word, right? It changes the way in which I think about language in many regards. It also makes me think about how do we got there? We need two things, according again to linguists, to be able to utter words, to speak sentences. We need a voice box to be able to speak, and we need neural pathways to be able to connect. That did not happen overnight. This has been developed over thousands of years, some say hundreds of thousands of years, depending on what linguists you take a look at, they'll say at least a million years. So this is a long journey that we've been on to be able to use speech, to be able to use words, to communicate. And we use words in different ways, and simple words can oftentimes have deeply profound different meanings depending on the context. The example I use, it may resonate with some, it may not, but our granddaughter likes to play this game whenever we pick her up from school, that every sentence has to end with yo or bro. I don't know where she got it from, right? So I was like, Amari, what do you mean? She's like, where are we going, yo? And I was like, I don't know, bro. Well, let's go get some ice cream, bro. Sure, yo, right? And we just go back and forth. Now, if we just take that word yo, Y-O, right? And I see my students in the hallway and they're like, yo, how was your weekend? And they're like, yo, right? That means something different than if they're trying to find their friend and they're like, yo. Same exact word, translating into deeply different complex thoughts. So language changes, it's plastic, it moves. And so if we take a look at what, again, most linguists say, and I definitely made sure I put up the Penfield Math League up there in honor of what folks are doing, but according to the United Nations, there are roughly 195 countries, some say more, given autonomous regions. Linguists say there are at least 6,000 languages in the world today. 6,000 languages in the world today. According to Merriam-Webster online, their online dictionary catalogs 470,000 word entries. That's in English alone, right? That English has roughly a half million words. If we say that not every language has a half million words, let's just say every language has roughly a quarter million words, 250,000 words. And that, I may be off or I may be way off. But if that was the case, and there's 6,000 languages, that means that in the world today, there can be at least 1.5 billion words. What makes some words carry much more weight than others? If we're talking about 1.5 billion, if we're talking about 500,000, why do some words carry much more weight, have the ability to impact us than other words? And that is for a number of reasons. Language can hurt, words can wound, and words have history. I was raised with an unfortunate saying. Some of you know it and can probably finish it. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. And I think it's unfortunate for a couple of reasons. One, I heard a remix of that saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will always hurt me, right? So I know when you see me, you're like, he should be a professional athlete. I appreciate that, thank you very much, right? So I knew I was gonna play basketball for the Knicks, right? Still waiting for that contract, but we'll talk about that. I knew I was gonna play basketball for the New York Knicks. With that being said, I've had two shoulder surgeries, I've had an ankle repair, and I've had an Achilles repair. I've had far more surgeries than any non-professional athlete should have, right? I have some memories of those injuries, you know, some idea of what happened. I definitely remember some of the recovery. I remember the surgeon that I worked with. I remember the support of my family to be able to recover. But 
most of it is very vague. I can tell you with great clarity, being in third grade, the first time somebody called me a racial slur. I can tell you what the room smelled like. I can tell you what the person was wearing. I can tell you what I was wearing. It's like one of those moments that are just frozen in time for me. And so I'm very much aware from my own experience and the experience that I talk with the students that there's this great, deeply hurtful, and if not traumatic experience when we use language of hate and language of hurt. And sometimes we do it without even noticing it, but it does not change the impact. And so that's one of the things that I wanna talk about moving forward. I use this example pretty regularly for two reasons. One, not just because it helps classify or codify what I'm trying to say, but much more importantly, what can happen next. So I would imagine some folks in the room are familiar with the story of the Little Rock Nine in Little Rock, Arkansas, when they were integrating Central High School in, eight, excuse me, in uh, 1957. It was such a contentious issue that we had to call in federal troops to usher folks into the building. This photograph became one of the most iconic photographs of the civil rights movement. Elizabeth Eckford is the young black woman sitting here. Hayes O'Brien is the young white woman behind her. When they were asking Elizabeth Eckford about what she remembers from that day, she, has no, she claims she has no memory of the thousands of people that lined the street. She had no memory of the fact that there were soldiers who were walking her into her high school front door. What she remembers is the name that she was being called as she was walking in, right? That's some pretty powerful stuff. If I can block all this other stuff out that's taking place, but the only thing I remember is what's behind me. But more importantly why I show this is that Elizabeth Eckford and Hazel Bryan would later travel the country together to demonstrate what reconciliation can look like. They would speak together. They would be in auditoriums together having conversations that a single mistake, they're both 15 years old in this video, in this photo, both 15 years old. That should not define your lifetime. That should not define who you are. A single mistake, whether it's said intentionally in hate or not, should not define the rest of our lives. We can condemn the action without condemning the person. And that's the work that we have to really focus on. How do we do this work of saying that, look, that act is wrong, but I still love you. I still care about you. I still want you in my community because they grew up and went to the same high school. So slurs degrade and dehumanize. Any slur you're talking about, if we look at the etymology, at the history, at the origin of almost every single slur, whether we're talking about ability slurs, or gender slurs, or sexuality slurs, or linguistic slurs, right? It doesn't matter the slur. If we study the history and the origin, almost without fail, it is deeply rooted in a history of pain in an attempt to other folks. You are not a member of my community. You are somewhere else. You are somewhere outside. And so I think it's important, and I say this to students on a regular basis, it's important for us to recognize the history of the language we use. And I oftentimes say, I'm not just talking about students, I'm talking about myself, right? I'm talking about myself. As a college faculty member, I regularly say things wrong, right? I regularly say things wrong. I misgender people, I use the wrong pronouns. Most often I do not say or speak a name correctly, I mispronounce names. And I tell folks, it doesn't matter if I speak Patois, doesn't matter if I speak French, doesn't matter if I speak Spanish. If a student has told me their name, I should take the time to practice the way in which they want that name pronounced. So my job is to learn, is to grow, is to hear what they're saying. The words that my generation, and I'm looking out here respectfully, our generation, right? The words that we use are not the same words that our students use. The words that I use are not the same words that my parents use, right? 
So I have to keep informing myself what's taking place as well. So we have to be aware that words have the ability to dehumanize people. And unfortunate reality, when we dehumanize people, then it makes taking action against them easier. It makes violence easier. It makes dismissing folks easier. It makes ostracizing folks easier. That's the purpose of slurs. That's the purpose of language that is built in hate. The goal is not to bring you in. The goal is to push you out. And so we have to think more deeply about what that means and what that looks like. I also spent some time talking about intent and impact. And this comes directly from Penfield High School students. They wanted to make sure that I spent time talking about that the intent is not nearly as important as the impact. And I know not everyone likes that idea, right? That I may not be meaning to say something hurtful, but it doesn't lessen the impact or the harm that one may experience. And the example I give is I was asked one time to um, put the dishes away from the dishwasher, my brother and I, right? And we decided, you know what? This plate right here, this makes a pretty good Frisbee, right? Now don't judge me, you all know what I'm talking about, right? So we're, we're playing Frisbee, we're having fun, we miss the Frisbee, hits a picture frame, the picture frame breaks. You can imagine my family, my mother and father were not happy. Now I can say to them, the intent was we were having fun. We were playing around. We were sharing a moment together. The impact is that the picture frame is still broken, right? The intent was not to break anything, but the impact is real. So the intent is about our goals. The impact is about reality. And it's not a 50-50 relationship. So when students come up to tell me that I said something wrong, I have to own it. I gotta own it. I don't try to defend myself. It's not what I was trying to say. No, I listen, I take it in, I try to do better the next time. It's not easy, but it's the right thing to do. And so we have to also work on helping our young folks understand that when someone brings something to their attention, the goal is not always to defend ourselves, the goal is to take it in and see if we can do something better or something different. I do not believe in cancel culture whatsoever. I think it's dangerous, to be honest. If we're defining people by the worst moments of our lives, if someone defined me by the worst moment of my life, I would not be here right now, right? For me, there always has to be room for reconciliation, for dialogue, for conversation. That is difficult as well. It puts undue responsibility on a number of folks, usually people who are the most marginalized. That part I understand. But we have 15-year-olds who post something that post goes viral, and now all of a sudden we've impacted their life tremendously? I'm nervous about that. I'm nervous about a culture that does that, right? I'd like to do something different than say, hey, again, you're a bad person. No, no. You made a bad mistake. You made an error in judgment. Let's talk about what that is. And so I don't believe in cancel culture, and I try to encourage our students to not engage in that sort of thing, right? That's not the way in which you build community that's not the way in which we build a better world either, right? We don't sort of go one for the other, and so that's a clear thing for me. So for me, it's not about blame, but it's about accountability. I have prejudicial thoughts on a regular basis. I'll drive by somewhere, I'll see something, and the first thought that pops in my head isn't always the best thought. And so I tell folks all the time, all of us have biases we all have prejudices. I can't get mad at anyone for their first thought. What I tell my students is I can hold you accountable for your second thought, right? So I can't get mad at you for your first thought, but your second thought, that's where we can have a little bit more conversation where I can hold folks accountable. So this is not about blame. Again, this is not about making folks, embarrassing folks in any way, shape, or form. This is about how do we get to a different process to be able to build community. I am a defender of free speech, give talks about it on a regular basis. I believe it's absolutely necessary. I begin my college classrooms by saying, uh, conflict is inevitable, combat is optional, right? 
My job is actually to encourage us to disagree. My job is to say things that you may not like to see if I can get you to be a critical thinker to push back, right? So I believe in the absolute necessity of free speech. And I'm also aware that we live in a society where not all speech is protected by a court of law. You can't go into a court of law and lie. That's not free speech, it's not protected. You can't actively and intentionally try to incite violence that is not protected by our current legal system, that is not it's already sort of taking back free speech. You can't engage in hate speech. I can't willingly defame someone and try to impugn your reputation. So we already have limitations on free speech. That part is clear. So while yes, there needs to be a way in which we have to disagree and you may not like what I say, we also have some times where not everything can be said in every space. And so what I try to encourage students to think about is location, space, and place. I would imagine for most folks, particularly those folks who are parents and caregivers, your young ones speak differently to their friends than they speak to you, right? I tell similarly, my father's name is Larry. I have never in my life called my father Larry. My Nana's name is Ruth. Wow, if I ever called her Ruth, that would not be good, right? So I already know that there are some things that I can say in certain spaces and some things I can't say, right? We already do that. If I walk into any house of worship, be it a temple, be it a synagogue, be it a church, I know that there's particular words that I should never utter. And I tell students schools are one of those places. You may talk a particular way amongst your friends, and there's not much that most folks can do about it, but it doesn't make that speech appropriate for school. School is a protected place, a place where we need to bring folks in, a place where we need to community build, not a place where we feel like we can say whatever we wanna say. That's not what it looks like. So for me, location, space, and place is absolutely key. And we can start teaching young people that on a, on a regular basis. So what does this mean for me? Words have history and words matter, right? It's incumbent upon us to understand what that history is, we have to learn that. We don't hear the same things. You may be saying something, but that's not the way in which it lands for me, right? And we have to work through that conflict if we're both willing, and sometimes we are not both willing, and I understand that as well, that's perfectly acceptable. Location, space, and place matter. I would imagine now more than ever, especially as we are on the other, let me rephrase this, especially as we continue to move through a global trauma with COVID, especially as we see some of the ways in which our young folks are impacted with their mental well-being, that we have to be much more aware of the physical, social, and mental well-being of our communities. It's absolutely essential. And I believe in this idea of calling people in, not calling people out. I never try to embarrass folks. Student says something in class that I know they shouldn't be saying. Depending on the context, I usually wait to after class and say, hey, can we have a quick conversation? Or I'll send an email. Or can you come see me at office hours? And we'll have a conversation there. Because my goal is to change the behavior. My goal is not to embarrass folks, right? My goal is not to have people feel less than. That, in my experience, that doesn't work. My goal is to uplift. Let me call you in. Let me bring you into my community. Let's have a dialogue and a conversation about that. So what did I tell our students to do today? One, when they hear language that is offensive, that tries to dehumanize, that tries to denigrate, respectfully interrupt. Respectfully interrupt. It may not be in that moment, it may be a day later, it may be after class, it may be at lunch, whatever it may be, but try to interrupt the behavior. Think before we speak, and think twice before we post, right? Think before we speak, and think twice before we post. Be aware of location, space, and place. Learn and educate ourselves. That responsibility for me falls upon us. It's my job to understand the origin of homophobic slurs. It's my job to understand the role of sexist slurs. And there's times where I have to use my privilege to make that interruption. So if we're having dinner and someone says something sexist, 
Thankfully, my spouse will look at me and say, you need to say something, right? It's not my place to always say something to interrupt forms of sexism. That's also your role. Use your privilege to interrupt that. That usually has much more power, and so I have to use my privilege in those spaces. So the more I learn, the more I know, the easier it is for me to respectfully interrupt and to call people in, not call people out. Now, real quick, there's all kinds of slurs, right? And we're not going to name them, right? But people refer to them, the N-word, a racial slur, the R-word, talking about an ability slur, uh, the F-word, talking about sexuality, the B-word, talking about gender as well. And my seven-year-old grandchild will constantly interrupt me because I have a really bad habit of saying something that is inappropriate. I know our students do as well. Something happens, and without even thinking, they say, that's so, fill in the blank. That's so, and they're not even thinking about it, right? But that's so, homophobic slur. That's so, gender slur. That's so, ability slur. You name it. I watch football, or basketball. I watch football, too. Right? I watch basketball, and my grandbaby would say, Papa, you can't say that. And I said, can't say what? She's like, you just said the S word. I said, I said, the S word? She's like, you can't say the S word. I said, Amari, what is the S word? Like, can I say it? Yes. No, Papa, can I say it without getting in trouble? Yes. What is the S word? You said stupid. You said that's so stupid. And every time I say it, which unfortunately has been often, she interrupts me. She challenges me. Now I say, if a seven-year-old can do that, we as adults have got to be able to do it. It may mean we have to retune our ears. It may mean we have to rethink some things. But I got a seven-year-old who constantly reminds me that I'm saying something that is hurtful, right? And challenges me not to say it. And so that's this idea about sort of calling folks in, not calling folks out. So before I take my seat, I share a couple of things of ways in which we can interrupt some of these languages when they happen, be it at work, be it at school, be it in community, be it wherever it may be, that someone says something that we find has the potential to harm, to cause damage. We can say, I don't find that funny. Or I, for me, this is much more my approach, I want to know more about why you said that. Now, for me, tone matters. I want to actually, I'm actually inviting. I'm not saying it to condemn. I'm not saying it to pass judgment. I really want to know. Tell me more about why you said that. Let's begin the conversation. Using that word doesn't help people feel safe or accepted, right? Or I also like asking questions. What do you mean when you say that? What are you trying to say? And did you mean to say something hurtful when you said that? These are just a couple of examples that we can use when we're in spaces and folks are saying things that have the potential to create an unsafe and unwelcoming environment. I appreciate the introduction. In Ithaca, we say, let me rephrase that, not in Ithaca, the Ithaca fourth graders, as we are going through our code of conduct and we ask them, what do you think our code of conduct should say? They came back with three words. Our code of conduct should say that students should be seen, heard, and known. Seen, heard, and known. And so I ask you all this evening, what are the ways in which we're disrupting language to make sure that people feel seen, heard, and known? I thank you for your patience, for your time. Thank you all very much. Good evening. I can't see all of you, but I'm sure you're out there. Thanks for being with us tonight. My name is Marianne Mustafa George, and I will be the panel moderator tonight. Um, I want to thank Dr. Sean Eversley Bradwell for his time with us, um, for sharing his story, for teaching us through the stories of the past and the present. So while we are setting up here, getting ourselves ready, I will share my story with you. Um, as I said, Mary Mustafa George. I am the Associate Director of Equity and School Services at the Children's Institute. Um, my work is with school districts 
in the region, um, as far afield as Saranac Lake. Uh, my work is around restorative practices, social emotional learning, and equity. Uh, I do a lot of work in aligning with the culturally responsive and sustaining framework, and I am so excited to be here to share time and stories with all of you tonight. I am a proud RCSD mom. I have two kids um, in the Rochester City School District, and I am holding a lot of the hurt and pain that we are as parents for our kids, so just holding that with all of you tonight. Um, we have a wonderful panel assembled tonight. Hi, everybody. I wish I could see you better. I wish we were more in a circle. So my work is in circle practices. This feels like I feel so far away from all of you. I wish we could just make a giant circle. Um, we have students, family members, faculty, um, Penfield graduates, now community partners, and each one of them brings a unique perspective and a role to our panel. So I'm going to introduce us all, and as I say your name, maybe you can put up your hand and just say hi. Yeah? All right. So we have Zipporah Sparkman, <laughs> currently 12th grade student at Penfield High School. Did you want to say hi? Did, welcome to say hello a few words. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here with the fellow panelists and excited to see what we all say. Awesome. We have Leah Ormachea. Hello, I'm really thankful to everyone for coming out and for setting this up. Um, I'm really excited to have this discussion with you all. And Leah is a 10th grade student at Penfield High School. We have Miss Jessica Kane. Here you are. <laughs> Hi, everybody. And Jessica is a Penfield Central School District parent with children attending Scribner and Bay Trail. All right, Dr. Shannon Cleverly Thompson. Hi, everybody who is also Penfield Central School District parent with your children are at Bay Trail and Penfield High School. Ms. Amy Powers. Hi, everyone. Who is an English language arts teacher at Bay Trail. Ms. Carmen Stout. Hello. Who is English as a new language, English as a new language teacher at Harris Hill. And Mr. Zach Evans. Hi, everyone. PSD graduate. PCSD graduate, class of 2009, and Mr. Justin Murphy. Hi. PCSD graduate, class of 2003. So before we begin our panel, I wanted to go back to the beginning of the evening um, with Dr. Kenny, who highlighted the district's work, the priorities, and the alignment with the culturally responsive and sustaining education framework. Um, our panel discussion tonight is going to dig a little bit deeper into that CRS principle of welcoming and affirming environments. We're going to do that by hearing about the experiences, the reflections, and the stories of our panelists. And we hope that this dialogue will continue to build and strengthen our community so that we can keep working towards making all spaces welcoming and affirming for all cultural and social identities. I want to go back to that slide. There was a green, with a green bubble on it, one of the slides. Um, and it, I don't, I don't know if I'm saying that, just a thank you. Yeah. It's way back. <laughs> <laughs> um, where we describe the New York State um, Education Department's definition and the description of a welcoming and affirming environment. So I, I want to put that out there for all of us on the table so we can refresh our memory. A welcoming and affirming environment is one that feels safe. It's a space where people can find themselves represented and reflected, and where they understand that all people are treated with respect and dignity. The environment ensures that all cultural identities, race, ethnicity, age, gender, sexual orientation, disability, language, religion, socioeconomic background are affirmed, valued, and used as vehicles for teaching and learning. And we talked earlier in the evening how we know this is happening. This is evidenced when the following are in place. A collective responsibility to learn about student cultures and communities, having close relationships with our students and families, social emotional learning programs, and materials that represent and affirm student identities. I want to take a minute to begin this panel discussion by thanking all of our panelists for their participation, to thank you in advance for sharing your stories, for your sharing your experiences and perspectives with us. And as I often do when I begin a circle, 
I would like to start our time together with a quote, an opening quote about storytelling. This one comes to us from Lucinda Floden and Dennis Frederick. They are also a duo known as the Story Weavers, and they say, stories simultaneously celebrate what is unique about us and provide bridges to what is common among us. And I hope that we can hear the stories tonight with the spirit in which they are given. So I'm gonna ask for five questions, and we have all seen the questions before, so we've had a little bit of time to mull them over. Um, each question that I'm gonna pose is an invitation. It's an invitation for each of our panelists to answer, answer as much or as little as you would choose to your comfort level. Um, and if there's anything else you may need for your comfort, let me know at any time. All right, first question, here we go. And I think we can start all the way down there. Is that all right? We'll start with you first and then we'll sure. just work our way down. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. So the first one for all of our panelists, if you would, I invite you to tell us a little bit about yourself by sharing your values, your core beliefs as they're aligned with the culturally responsive sustaining education framework and the principle of welcoming and affirming environment. It's a long one. Do you want me to say it again? I, 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 <laughs> Tell I, us I neglected to print out a copy. That was, I was <laughs> yeah. not being as required. But thank you so much. Um, so again, I'm Amy Powers. I currently teach English. It's very hard not to be able to see you all. Um, yeah. I currently teach eighth grade English at Bay Trail, and next year we'll be at the high school. So I have the unique opportunity of being able to work in our middle school with some fantastic students and families, and to transition to the high school, which is really exciting for me. I also happen to be a parent of two Penfield students, so I find myself uh, self-straddling both those worlds. Um, so a little bit about me, I've um, come to the education world later in my life than students just out of grad school, which I think is giving me the unique opportunity to live in different environments and different job arenas and different experiences that I can bring into my classroom. One of them is I obviously studied English in college, but I also double majored in um, anthropology. So my personal interest and in drawing and curiosity to the different cultures and people of the world drives who I am and my natural curiosity um, as a human but also as an educator. So being able to embrace um, a welcoming and affirming environment in my classroom has come um, gleefully to me in being able to celebrate the things that I find so interesting and unique about all of us. Um, do you want me to wrap it up or do you want me to say something about my classroom? I don't want to hog the mic. You can say. Okay, I'll just, okay, so it has been <laughs> delightful to be able to celebrate people in my classroom and I think that many, and you, you could ask many numbers of wonderful teachers, the first thing you do is stand outside your door and you say good morning to your students. You know every single one of them by name. I'm goofy and sometimes do nicknames, but that's the first way you establish a relationship with, with everyone. You know, you make eye contact, you, you welcome them into the classroom, and uh, the classroom environment should feel safe and affirming in the sense that they see something of themselves there. And a couple of the things that um, our fantastic guest speaker talked about that really resonated with me was not only how powerful words are, because as someone who is passionate about words, I recognize that power. I reflect that in the bulletin boards and everything in my classroom. But I love that he said we have to retune, retune our ears, because music is such a passion of mine as well, that, that that really stuck with me. And I think being able to show those different musical notes in the way a classroom sings um, is a great opportunity for me to be able to do in my classroom. Sir, great. thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Zach Evans. I graduated, uh, as the introduction said, from Penfield in 2009. Um, my, I'll try and keep my background short because it's sort of all over the place. Um, I also didn't go right to grad school, not into the teaching uh, realm, which I'm putting the cart before the horse there. I worked in radio um, for about five, four and a half years full time in Buffalo. That's where I am now, and that's where I drove in from today. I work currently as a policy specialist in Erie County government. Um, I am also finishing up my PhD in sociology at the University at Buffalo, where I also teach. Uh, and I teach quite a bit on diversity and also social research and law and society work. And um, so that sort of dovetails really well into what Penfield has really put forward um, as its sort of goals and what it wants to highlight. So someplace that I was very proud uh, to graduate from in all my years here, it, it's really sort of empowering and, and 
refreshing to see a, a district really taking the lead on these sort of issues. Um, related to my own values, I, I have four points that I jotted down here, and I've actually discussed these with people in many different travels. Um, and I've been called sometimes naive on them. And I don't actually think that's true. The first one being, it's really not that hard to be nice. And I've gotten into quite a few arguments with people, which is sort of a strange reflection, right? Like people are arguing, no, it is hard to be nice. Like, it's not. And the, the line I often hear is that it's easier for people to be jerks or mean or unkind or thoughtless. And even if that's true, both being a jerk and unkind and being nice and kind take energy and agency. And I think, again, this is just my own sort of worldview and thought, that it's a matter of directing that energy and agency, right, in how we interact with others and how we, you know, present ourselves in any given moment or social interaction. Uh, and then the, the, just the second point, and I'll wrap this up, is that, again, very simple and sometimes told that it's naive, is that people matter, right? Like, a very simple, thing that every human has worth by simply existing like people matter and we should want people to do well and again these are simple things that I don't I can't pinpoint where they came from um, but that's sort of my uh, my core beliefs and values and I think uh, what Penfield's doing here sort of echoes that uh, in small and large and meaningful ways Hello everyone, I'm Zipporah Sparkman. I'm a senior here at Penfield High School and I'm incredibly blessed to be here and share my experience as a senior, um, having spent the last uh, nine years in the Penfield Central School District. Um, my family moved here to Penfield in fifth grade um, and I can say full heartedly that it's been a, a difficult transition at first, but a full hearted um, and welcoming one. I do feel that Penfield is my home and that I've made friends and family here, not necessarily blood, um, but I do see myself staying here and helping create the community that we want to see. Um, I will say that at the high school, I'm involved in a couple different, um, uh, I guess I'll say clubs and groups, whether that be musically, um, in different choirs, um, uh, diversity and equity inclusion related, and a couple different groups that way. Um, so I've, I've definitely made my presence here at Penfield, and I'm happy to pass the baton on to those who follow me as a graduating senior. Um, and just to kind of segue after what Mr. Evans said, um, the, the fact and the point that people matter just kind of reminded me of a TikTok I actually saw, so <laughs> woo, TikTok. Um, <laughs> um, in that it's, it's kind of a paradox that humans are fighting for human rights when it's humans who are giving the rights. It just seems so bizarre to me that it's something that we have to continually fight for. When it's humans who are, um, who are taking away the rights of other humans, it just seems, I guess if we were on Mars and it was aliens who were taking away our human rights, it seems like that would make more sense, but I mean, it, it just takes work and it takes practice and it takes um, an open mind and a willing heart to get there and I'm happy that we're taking the first steps as a community. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Shannon Cleverly Thompson and um, besides being a mom to um, two boys in the district, I'm also a faculty member at St. John Fisher College and I teach in uh, the EDD program for executive leadership and also the chair of the program. So. I'm usually very comfortable in a group setting because I'm talking about leadership and research. So I'm a little nervous because I'm going to be talking about myself tonight. So if you just be a little bit uh, patient. <laughs> so that's why I had to write everything down because um, I'm usually talking about anything but myself. So I think to answer that question, my values stem from my family, family first and foremost, and um, authenticity, trust and learning, because I am a nerd. Um, my kids know that I'm a nerd. I think it just means that I love to learn and I love to read. And I also have a value of social justice. And for me, that really means that people are given um, equal opportunities and are accepted for who they are. Not that you have to agree with everything that they say, but that 
people get an opportunity to be who they are. And I think some people will call me an advocate. And I, I, I just, I sometimes can get a little bit, my, my, actually my kids were like, mom, don't go crazy tonight because um, they were a little worried I would say something that would come back to them. And so I just wanna make sure that I'm here for me. I'm not here for my kids. My experiences are mine. They're not my kids and they're not my husband's. They know and I'm here and they support, but I, I won't say that there wasn't some trepidation in saying yes and sharing my experiences. Um, I also did not grow up in New York. I grew up in Kansas and I'm not a New York native. So I grew up in a small town in Kansas with my dad, a Republican, and my mom who's here tonight is a Democrat. So I had multiple perspectives growing up and I've been here since 2000 and I think about the time that Mr. Evans graduated is when <laughs> we um, moved. And so my, my kids have been in Penville through second, from first kindergarten till, till now. So I also just want to, to share that, um, that I do acknowledge that I, I come from a um, middle class, white, um, privileged experience. So I want to acknowledge that those are part of my, my story. And I really wanna thank Penfield School District for providing this opportunity for our kids and for tonight to open up the space to share our experiences and um, learn from each other and create this space to maybe make some change in our community. So thank you. And Patsy. Hello everyone, I'm Leah Orme Ormachea. Um, as you heard in the first intro, I'm a sophomore here at PHS and I'm here to, short, to sort of share my experiences as a queer student in this school district. Um, I think a lot of my values stem from my family and the experiences that they have given me growing up. Um, I'm very lucky to have um, a lot of exposure to like different cultures and like different people um, and just really appreciating what the world has to offer. I think that there is so much that every single person has to offer and so much to learn in the world. So it's a little baffling that people want to lock that away and not hear everyone's story. Um, I also believe that, I also believe in an individual's freedom to find happiness. I think as long as it doesn't hurt anyone, then, some, then people should be allowed to do what they want, love who they want, do what makes them comfortable, and really pursue the life that they want to live. Um, and I think that's all for me. I can pass it on to Ms. King. Thank you. I just feel really privileged to be here on this panel with already some really amazing folks and hearing people's values. Um, I'm Jessica Kane. I'm a parent here in Penfield of two boys. I have uh, one son at Scribner and uh, one, here, uh, one at Bay Trail. Um, I am also an educator. I'm a school counselor in the Grace School District and uh, in the high school. Um, I teach cultural responsive education classes to our teachers. Um, that has given me um, a whole different experience on another level when we're talking about race. Such a complex experience, being a parent, being a woman, being of color, and now in this community, um, I too was a bit res you know, hesitant to participate, thinking about my children and what could come back to them. But I thought I have to, because the hope that I have for my children and for this community is, it's intense. I can't even explain it. My heart is just full of passion and hope and what I do on a daily basis a complete career change I had. I was not in education. I really firmly believe that everyone has the ability to learn from another. And our stories are just an opportunity. Our stories are a place where we can learn and build empathy and have love for one another. We may not always agree, but having that belief, I can tell you, gets me into trouble a lot. 
Um, and I laugh at myself often because sometimes I might cry <laughs> or I might break down or be angry or think someone else can't learn and that's not always productive. But I think that um, this is a great opportunity and I am appreciative to be here um, and I'm hoping my story is one that can help. Um, <clears throat> my name is Justin Murphy. I'm, um, I, I grew up in Penfield. I graduated from high, Penfield High School in 2003. And uh, right now I'm the education reporter at the Democrat and Chronicle. I've been at the DNC for um, 10 years, and most of that time writing about education. Uh, and I just recently had a book published uh, on the topic of school segregation in Rochester, um, the history of it, the effect of it, and, and how we can combat it. Um, I was particularly interested in Dr. Eversley Bradwell's uh, presentation about, about language because I actually had a, um, a brief first career as a linguist. I got a degree in um, linguistics from the University of Chicago and I uh, taught linguistics at the University, uh, uh, Vilnius University in Lithuania for a year before returning. And in the summer before that, um, I was uh, working on a research project uh, around Lake Tahoe with a Native American tribe called the Washoe uh, and they have a, the Washoe language. There was only at that time maybe 15 native speakers left and they didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly written down and, and the whole grammar of it had not really been worked out. Um, so our job was to sit down uh, with the elders who spoke the language and ask them, how do you say I'm going to cross the street? How do you say I want to cross the street? How do you say I used to cross the street? And we, were, we would record that and chop it up and figure out which bit meant, meant what and then put it into this online dictionary. Um, and that was very uh, fulfilling work. But then sometimes at the end of the day, after we'd done that, we would have dinner with them or we would attend some kind of community event with them. And in that setting, um, they would tell us these stories about when they were younger and, and the, the traditions of their tribe and what the area used to look like and uh, the stories that they had grown up with. And I realized from that part of the experience that um, I was a lot more interested in that than what I was getting paid to do during the day. Uh, and that over several years sort of brought me to journalism, um, realizing that what I really wanted to do was hear people's stories and kind of be a conduit for them. Um, and that is, in the, my, I would say that that's a core belief of mine is the trust in, in that process. Um, you know, being in daily journalism it, or, or even with my book, you know, you, you write something and it's, you think it's important, you think people should be mad or excited or interested or whatever and you don't actually know if that happens. You know, like I'm not in their house when they're absorbing that. Maybe I get a dozen tweets, maybe I get 50 tweets, but that, I don't really know. So that, that's where I fall back on this belief that by, by telling each other's stories um, and by putting it out there, uh, it can do some good even if we don't see it. Hi everyone, my name is Carmen Staub. Um, I am the, now my title is very complicated actually. It's Annal Teacher, English as a New Language. Everyone is confused by it. Um, it's only called Annal in New York State, um, Essel, anywhere else pretty much. Um, but basically I help teach kids English um, and those kids usually speak a different language at home. Um, so I. I'm in six different classrooms at Harris Hill from kindergarten through fifth grade in all of those grades. And I go into their classrooms a lot, so I don't only work with English, English language learners, I also work with students who are native speakers. Um, the students that I work with come from, well, not all of them, a lot of them are from America, but their families come from many different countries. Um, in Penfield alone, we have dozens of different languages spoken here um, by our families. Like, 
I don't, I should know the number probably, but it's, it's a lot. Actually, I was surprised when I found out. Um, I teach students from all different socioeconomic statuses and um, students of all different races and religions. Um, everyone is different is, is my point basically. And I had to write down uh, my big uh, values and core beliefs. I never really thought about it before I put it into words. Um, but I strongly believe that people should be able to make decisions for themselves and live however they want to live as long as it's not um, harmful to others. Um, I believe that no one should be left behind and that people's rights should be protected and certain people have more responsibility than others to make sure everyone's rights are protected including our leaders and um, being a school district and a teacher. Um, I also believe that um, we should have accessible language and education. Being a language teacher, I deal with students who, a lot of students have no idea what they're listening to or what they're seeing. Um, and uh, student empower empowerment is another one. Um, specifically teaching kids to think critically, um, being transparent with everyone around you, including kids, as long as it's appropriate, of course, um, and also teaching history in an honest way so that kids understand why things are the way they are and how we all got here. Um, specifically for my job, um, of course, I care about all students being safe, um, but also all of their identities being affirmed in the classroom. Um, I want my students to feel like they belong and can be different. They don't have to change who they are to fit in with everybody else. I also want them to be effective communicators and um, specifically by increasing vocabulary and teaching them social language, um, which our speakers tonight, a lot of people have touched upon. Um, let's see, I wrote down a lot, but I'm sure we'll be able to get to that in the next question, so I'm good. <laughs> Thanks, Carmen. All right, so I just want to thank all of you, that first question, for your vulnerability, <coughs> for your openness. I know that some of you have lifted the fact that you're here and you have students in the district, so that, that's a challenge, and some of you are students and you're speaking from your own experience, but you're also holding so much of everybody else's experience, too, so thank you for that. For, for being able to be so open right off the bat. Um, our next question, I have a feeling we've kind of already answered this, and so I'm gonna ask the question, and then I'm gonna remind us of some of the things that we heard, because it might you know, recall something that's bubbling up for you. So this is a question for everybody again, and the question is, what should a welcoming and affirming environment look like, feel like, and sound like in the Penfield Central School District? When we asked you about your values earlier, some of the things that you talked about were being able to see something of ourselves in the spaces we're in. You talked about the pride in the work that's being done in the district. You talked about having an open mind and a willing heart. Um, the concept of hope was one that we heard and how we connect to one another. Um, and this feeling that connects with connects us to one another and the power of being able to hear each other's stories empowerment and belonging so i'm going to ask that question again and if anyone wants to answer and go first go for it what should a welcoming and affirming environment look like feel like and sound like in the penfield central school district any takers i can hop on go for I'm it next in the rotation again um, I consider it a, a tremendous honor and privilege to be in the classroom, being an educator. Um, again, came to me later in life and it's absolutely 200% where I belong. But a welcoming and affirming environment should be the joy and compassion that the educator in the room, or more than one educator, has in the room for the students. But that also means that even though I take um, my job with tremendous gravity, that there's humor. I think that there's a place for that in the classroom and that we can laugh together, we can make mistakes together. I think the students think I'm joking, but I quite often use the phrase, let's just try to get through this with some grace and dignity. Mm -hmm. And I really do mean that. You know, just to get through, sometimes we're not having the best day, maybe they're not, I'm not, we're not connecting, but we still see each other, we hear each other, we try to have a laugh, we try to have compassion. 
So I think that's really an important part of, no matter what our differences might be outside of the classroom, our families, our backgrounds, our opinions, it's how we come together in this space to try to, to grow as humans that is ultimately um, you know, what, we're, what we're trying to do, what we're all trying to do. So. I think Ms. Power summed up everything that I thought I could have said perfectly. <laughs> um, I will add um, that I, I like the idea of having empathy, not just acknowledging um, the feelings and the sensations of students and, and um, teachers in the room, but also feeling those, those emotions that come with just living life. I think the past two years have taught us there's so much out of our control. And even as I move into college, I'm realizing that there is so much out of my control. Um, and I think it's important that I empathize with everyone in the classroom, whether this is a teacher, teacher's aide, a teacher, um, to another student, and student to teacher, like I said. Um, and I think that's, that's important to creating a welcoming environment. Um, on a more local or a more public scale, I think a welcoming and affirming environment should be known to other districts. I think when people hear of Penfield, at least my hope would be that people know that this is a place where everyone is welcome. And that can be done through social media and um, through making connections. And I, I believe we are doing an amazing job of doing that. Um, but um, no buts. And um, <laughs> as we continue to grow and as we continue to do that, I think the welcoming and affirming piece comes from people recognizing that we are welcoming and affirming and actually being um, that place for people and not just um, a, a, a word or, a, or a, a goal, we actually enact that goal. Anyone else? I, I would just like to point out from a parent perspective that, um, that, parents, are, that parents are welcomed and aren't questioned with, by their presence because they might look different or um, not like the majority. So I think all parents that go to events should be welcomed and feel like their presence is um, affirmed. So from a parent perspective, that's what I think a welcome environment should look like. And also that, that student strengths are highlighted and it's not a deficit model in terms of what they don't have or what they don't do, but what their strengths are. And I, I do have to point out that for me, it would also be that students of all abilities are seen and heard and respected. So that's one of a strong value for me. So it would be that all, all abilities, mm -hmm. physical and invisible, or being visible and invisible abilities. So. Um, Zach, did you wanna have a chance? Yeah, I, I intentionally uh, wanted to listen a little bit here because being, um, being a, a, an alum of Penfield, um, I wanted to process a little more. You know, I, I, I'm referencing when I was here versus what might be going on now or you know, how things have changed in over 10 years now. Um, I really, really like what Zipporah said about empathy. Um, in my own teaching at UB, I, my sort of teaching philosophy is focused on empathic teaching. And not just in the classroom teaching, I think, I think empathy is something that you can't have a welcoming and affirming environment without. Um, if, if there isn't that sort of ingrained and felt and understood empathy and you're trying to have welcoming and affirming communities, like, I think, I think it's gonna be a swing and a miss. Um, and the, the other thing that, again, not being a current student and not being a parent, um, I just had this thought while you were speaking that I think sometimes uh, parents get a little more agitated or hesitant to the idea of a welcoming and affirming environment than students, right? I think we all know like when we're younger, we're more resilient, we're more open to change, we're, we bounce back and, and find things and understanding, excuse me, find understanding new things a little more uh, routine. And I think sometimes parents and adults, right? The older we get, maybe the more curmudgeon we get, the more stuck in our ways we get. Um, so again, not being in this district right now, but just thinking sort of out loud and, and, and a more macro level, I think welcoming and affirming um, environments in, in school settings, right? I think students taking the lead uh, in many ways is beneficial. How about this um, Yeah, I guess I'll go if no one else wants to. 
I think especially connecting to what um, Mr. Evans said earlier about how it's not difficult to be kind and also connecting to that topic of empathy, I think just really trying to see like where other people are coming from and just like doing, because it's not hard to like respect someone, it's not hard to just be nice to them. I think it's a lot easier than most people make it seem. Um, when I talk, I think I'm going to be really focusing on like LGBT plus specific um, situations just because that's what I prepared for and that's what I was invited on to talk about. Um, I think just being like accepting and open to like affirm your students' identities and like let them know that like you will respect them, like you will use their pronouns, you will use their name, um, and that they're like free to express themselves in your classroom because a lot of people I know like they're not really safe to truly express themselves in their own homes so like we might as well make school a place where they can be themselves. I think good ways to do this could be like asking for pronouns and names at the beginning of the year and like really using them like not just saying it and forgetting about it but like using people's names and pronouns or like just putting like a pride flag on the door if someone tells you that you tells you that their pronouns are she, her, then their pronouns are she, her, they, them, then their pronouns are they, them. I think it truly is suicide prevention, to be quite honest, and just like really um, putting yourself in their shoes and being like, if they feel this way, then like, I'm going to respect that. So kind of going off a little bit about what you're saying, Leah, is um, when, I, when I think about a welcoming and affirming environment, I think of one that the adults are modeling and learning. You know, the, these things, you know, we, we don't go in, at least I hope, into whatever career we chose and we're just done. Um, we need to learn and read what we don't know. And if we're to provide an environment that's welcoming and in, including everyone in our classrooms. Well, we need to talk, hear their stories. We have to model. We have to interrupt. And I can tell you as a parent that it's not good enough to have a couple pockets of people that are willing to champion and support my child. It's not enough to have two or three people for my child to go to when something was said in the classroom. And what I mean by something, I mean something so pervasively horrifying that it shouldn't mean that it has to be the right person who's willing to do the work to step in and interrupt that. It has to be an environment where every single person that my child sees during that day is on board and they're going to do it because that's what we want as a community, that's what parents want, that's what education is, that's what being an educator is for all students. And I think that if we could get there and not have things be by choice, you know, where it's, well, I know that that's your opinion or that's where you stand, but this is your classroom, and you have varying perspectives and backgrounds in that classroom. And if you're the person that's not willing to learn and not willing to step in and protect these children, protect my child, then you're not doing your part in creating this environment that we so desperately, I mean desperately, right? We know it's desperate right now that we need that. And I think if that person can't provide it, then we have to look at what is it that we're doing as a whole, and I know that, that this is part of that, and that's what's exciting about this. But when we talk about language, and we talk about being open-minded, and we talk about you know, bringing people in and not calling them out. I will be honest, sometimes as a parent, I'm having a really hard time with that these days because I'm at a point I would love to call you out. <laughs> it, it's just not okay. 
and I think to rely on another student, uh, another 12-year-old student or something like that, or an 8-year-old student, to be the one to speak up and help them be the ones to provide that environment, that's, that's not, as a parent, what I'm looking for. And I can tell you as an educator, that's not what works and that's not what's sustainable. I think a really important aspect of it is that um, it needs to be very much overt. Um, a, a, a misconception that I lived with for the majority of my life was that um, racial diversity was for black kids, not for me. Talking about misogyny was for women, not for me. Talking about homophobia was for LGBTQ kids, not for me. Um, and so like when I think, well, what would a welcoming and affirming place look like for me? You know, I'm, I'm a white male, cisgender, heterosexual, not differently abled, not poor. Like the, the, literally the entire United States of America is a welcoming and affirming place for me. It was, it was laid out for me. Um, <clears throat> but like because of that, I, I never noticed that. I, I never noticed that, that my experience might be different from other people's. And, and I wish I had, I had had some context to understand that earlier. That's why uh, I talk about integration so much because that would have helped me learn. And I think the adults in charge of my education or, or elsewhere in my life talking me through that would have helped me to learn as well. Um, like going off of what Justin and Jessica just said, I agree. I also think that in order for us to have a welcoming and affirming environment, um, what we're doing and teaching our students should be overt and all of the adults, it's our responsibility. We can't just put it on the kids to be doing this. Um, we should be teaching them these things too, but we have that responsibility as the adults. Um, to me, I don't know if I'm the only elementary school person on the panel, um, but I, I believe this should begin in kindergarten. I don't think kindergartners are too young. They already are aware of people looking different from them and sounding different from them. Um, in terms of what this environment should look like, um, the most simplest way for me to tell is that all students want to be at school and that they like school. Um, my students, a lot of my students often don't want to um, ever talk about their home background. If I ask them, like I know they speak this language at home, I know they know this certain custom or this word, I'll ask them about it, they'll say, I don't, I don't want to say it because they're too shy to or they're not used to bringing that stuff from home into school. And that makes me really sad. And um, I guess one thing I forgot to mention in my background, I am half Filipino. My mom is from the Philippines. She came here when she was 30. And I am just about to be 30. So it's crazy now thinking, wow, she was already as old as me when she came here. That's a huge change. Um, my father is a white American. And I was not an L. English is my first language, but I now see, or actually when I became an adult, um, I realized that I did not really see myself as Filipino. I identified more as being white, and that was because everyone around me was white. Even at, in my home, my mom didn't feel, um, I don't know if it was cultural because the Philippines was colonized and now very much influenced by American culture. Um, she wasn't super like, oh, I'm Filipino, this is the Philippines, you need to learn Tagalog. She actually deliberately didn't teach it to me because she didn't want my dad to feel left out. And so now when I see my like five and six year old students showing signs of that too, I'm like, oh no, what can I do to help them um, be proud of their heritage? Um, I also think having a welcoming and affirming environment means that teachers and students are also making these connections to student backgrounds, but not in uncomfortable ways, not in like you're in the spotlight type of way. 
just like uh, this is normal and natural and you're part of our community. So when we are talking about, I don't know, um, when Columbus first came here, let's talk about the Caribbean because they also came to the Caribbean and you're from Puerto Rico and that was a huge part of that history. Um, talking about parents, a lot of the parents of my students, especially those who don't speak English, um, aren't aware of everything that's going on in the district because of their limited English. And the district and my school too try so hard to translate as much as possible, but there's still, um, there's so much that goes out there for communication. And I think a welcoming environment would mean parents, all parents are aware of everything that's happening in the schools and kids are participating in um, out-of-school activities because they know about it, and just feeling part of the community in school and also out of school. Thanks, Carmen. So I'm noticing lots of nodding yeah. and verbal affirmations here up at the table, and from what I can see as well, um, lots of nodding in the audience. So I wanted to remind our panelists that you will have a chance to make connections to anything that was said up here. And for those of you in the audience, you'll have a chance to give us your burning questions if anything's coming up for you afterwards. So hold on to those thoughts. Um, we're going to go into our third question now. This one is again for everybody. Thinking about, we opened the door to some real talk here up on stage. So we're going to continue with the real talk for you, for all of you to tell us about, if you would. Tell us about your experiences with the Penfield Central School District. Have you, your family, or your observations of others that you know, have they been welcoming and affirming? And maybe we'll start on this side. Anyone want to go? Do you want to go first, Carmen? I can start, okay. sure. <laughs> um, first, I want to start with examples that I think have been so welcoming and affirming um, with specific teachers that I work with. Um, one amazing thing I've seen in a kindergarten classroom, um, so I had this new student come in from Ukraine um, like a month ago, and she spoke, I think the only words she knew was like yes and no. And the teacher had throughout the year been doing community circles with her class, and I don't know if you're familiar with community circles, but it's when, I mean, I'm not the expert here, but it's amazing, everyone sits in a circle and they have the opportunity to answer from um, like a prompted question and it's, it's a safe place, they can pass if they want to. Um, but she's starting even in kindergarten, which is not easy at all because all the kids are moving around and it, they have a short attention span. But anyway, my point was she held another circle, which all the kids were already used to, and, and um, got them ready to welcome in this new student. and. That, that included um, telling them she's, she doesn't know very much English and how can you make her feel welcome? What's something that you can say or do? And so all the kids really took the time to think about it and gave examples and gave each other ideas. And then when she came, all of the kids were very welcoming to her. They weren't surprised or confused by her not understanding them. They understood that she was smart, just as smart as they were, um, but just doesn't know the words in English to say yet. And when I come in there, and I don't speak Russian or Ukrainian, we speak with uh, Google Translate, which is really not that great when you're communicating with a five-year-old, um, but it, it can be very distracting. It's super loud, it's a weird robot voice, and all the five and six-year-olds, they're not bothered by it. They're not all staring like, what is that? Um, because they were prepared ahead of time. And I see that in some of the other classrooms I'm in too, just being very direct with the kids and, and talking to them about what can you do to help your classmates feel more welcome. Um, that, I think, has really taught me a lot as a teacher. And um, let's see what else I put here. I think that some teachers are taking so much time to educate themselves on student backgrounds. I think everyone needs to do that, and it takes a, it's a lot of work and energy. Um, it's not always easy, but I think it's needed. Um, let's see here. Do you have anything else to build off that? I don't want to be talking forever. <laughs> um, I mean, so like I said, I, I, I certainly felt uh, unequivocally welcomed and affirmed in Penfield. So I, 
I think about my experiences since then, and, and as a reporter, I, I have spent a good bit of time in the last few years talking to kids who, who um, are activists and, and seeing the way that they interact. And, and so I see, um, I have seen in Penfield and elsewhere really impressive um, allyship, really impressive communication among kids that I don't think me and my friends were up to uh, 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, I also think back to what I missed when I was in school. And, and one thing I think about is um, the kids in the urban suburban program. Um, it just, as far as I could tell, they just liked to hang out together. <coughs> they were just all friends with each other. and. Uh, when I was going to basketball practice after school, then they were usually sitting by the bus loop. And I don't know, I don't know why they're doing that, they just were doing that. Um, and sometimes from one year to the next or in the middle of the year, one of them wouldn't be going to our school anymore. And I wouldn't really think anything about that either. Um, when I was in school 20 years ago, I'm, I'm afraid to say that we used to call things gay or use the F word like every day, all day. That was just normal. Um, and I, so I wonder, I, I think back to, to everybody who wasn't included in my little bubble as to what that felt like for them. And, and I, I'm certain and I fear that it wasn't as welcoming as, and affirming as, as my experience was. Um, I have had some beautiful moments as a Penfield parent, um, which is why I, I have stayed. You know, I think that um, one thing that my husband and I have contemplated over the years since we've been in, in this town, um, should we move? Are we doing the right thing? Um, are we doing the right thing for our children? Do they need to be in a space where more kids look like them? And that's a very real thing to grapple with as a parent, sometimes on a daily basis. Um, and it can be very hard. Um, I think I have been blessed by making connections because I'm a people person, I'm a feeler, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a school counselor, and I uh, love to try to make connections with people but I do gotta say that it's a hustle. Um, there are times that I have to do things that maybe my white counterpart might not have to. Um, I have to hustle in some spaces for my kids to ensure that they are okay and they are being heard and they are being seen, whether it's a specific assignment or something that they've heard, or being called a name repeatedly. Um, you know, I think we are in a place and time where it is just common language on a day-to-day -day basis. My child will come home and say what they hear down the hall. It's just, it's just common to hear the N-word all the time, every day, all the day, all day, and then, when asked to stop, someone will say, well, that's not what I said. I said rigor. I said rigor to you. Now, he is not dumb. I'm not dumb. But I will tell you, the hustle's real. You have to make those connections. And I think because of that, we've had a good experience for the most part. But I can tell you there are times where I'm tired and it's not okay to maybe have to have to do that. And so I think that there are definite areas where things can be improved to be able to make a space for our kids, no matter who they are, what they look like. And I, I just think that it's something that we can improve on, and I'm very hopeful that we can. And I think the pockets where people are 
really committed to that, I want more support for them so that their work and their voices are ones that um, can be the loudest. They need support um, in, in our buildings too. Um, so. Um, yeah, I think that there has been, I mean, in the LGBT community, like in general, like for the past like 20 years, um, 30 years, there's been a lot of strides forward, which is incredible. Um, and in this district too, especially, I notice the efforts that have been made to be more vocal about um, the fact that like we exist and that we're like normal and that it's okay to be a girl and like girls or like be non-binary or like not have romantic feelings for people and like normalizing that. And it's really nice like just seeing pride flags in the hallway or like in rooms, like I feel safer knowing that, okay, like even if individual people, like, you know, there's so much homophobia and transphobia, but it's like, at least this is here, at least as like a symbol to sort of like be like, okay, I'm not alone in this. Um, however, there's still so much that needs to be done. I just, I know like I'll have my friends come to me like Leah, someone called me the F slur again and I cried and like it's horrific to see that happen to my friends. And like a lot of my friends, they're trans, they'll be in their classes. It is a rarity to see them get gendered correctly. And I think that the main people that people call them by their names, their chosen names and their real names is just because they don't know their dead names. And it's really upsetting that it's like something special. One time that stands out to me is, so we were in a class, I was with, two of my friends were there, they were both trans, and they got misgendered, they were called like ladies, and it's like, okay, well, we're not ladies, so like, you know, it's hard enough to stand up for that, like even just the first time, and then the teacher kept going like, oh, well, I'm trying not to be rude, I mean, I see two ladies in front of me, would you rather I call you girls? Um, and like, I had to literally step in and be like, they're guys, they use he, him pronouns, they're men. Like, it's like, I wish, I don't think that that teacher intended to cause harm, but it's just like, you know, like, it's very hard to deal with. It's basically like you're telling that person, you'll never pass, you'll never be good enough, you'll never be a real man. And just, it's like, couldn't you have come to that conclusion a bit sooner like given the circumstances and also just like having more education and like spreading that more so that that teacher could have known to like correct um themselves sooner and also just knowing that like um there's not a lot of representation like like there is more representation but it's also still very isolating like you know, straight relationships are the norm and you don't often see like gay relationships, you don't see trans, trans people. Whenever there's non-binary programs, it's always after like this little joke, like he, she, they, it. I can't keep up. Like, okay, um, well, maybe we can start trying to keep up and maybe we don't have to do that because it's like very invalidating and kind of just, oh, pronouns, this silly little thing, they don't matter, but they do matter and it all matters so much. However, I'm very thankful that we're having conversations like this today. I know at a religious school, not far from here, down the street, uh, they have seen this openness about topics such as this as a bad thing and will be making students sign a lifestyle contract to attend the school next year saying that they must be um, heterosexual, they must be cisgender if they want to attend that school. So I am happy for the openness surrounding this and the overall attitude of condemnation towards homophobia and transphobia. Thanks, Leah. So as a parent um, with a child that um, has a diagnosed disability, my experience as a parent kind of reflects both a welcoming and affirming environment, but also one that not always was that. Um, so I attended an 
when my kids were in elementary school, many meetings with administrators and, and teachers um, to advocate for accommodations for, for uh, my child. And I will be honest that those meetings were actually the opposite of welcoming and affirming. Uh, I don't know if anyone has ever attended one, but and they may have changed since I was um, a parent of elementary school students, but they were often um, set up to be almost like an us versus them with me going and trying to make sure I had all the evidence I needed to present my case for my child to have um, the accommodations that were actually required because of the disability. And I think that those were very exhausting at times and lonely and thankfully my kids did not see that part of my experience and they look back at their elementary days and have great stories and have had awesome teachers but as a parent i often felt like the theme song to the you know when the wicked witch shows up in the wizard of oz i often felt like that was being played when i showed up at the school like here she comes again um she's going to ask for something and it, so it, it it really wasn't that welcoming early on as a parent and i'm happy to say that there were some changes administratively and the last few years were much better but it, it was an exhausting stressful time as a parent just trying to advocate for what um, children children need so i will say that i also had a parent that called me on a Saturday morning, and a, t a teacher that called me on a Saturday morning um, interested in what I thought about her ideas to support my child's success. And I'll never, ever forget it because it was a Saturday morning, and a teacher is calling me on her weekend to come up with ideas and get to know my child better, to see how she could better support his success. And it was the first time that it ever happened and he was in the fifth grade. So I was just, so I was just, I'll never forget that. So, I mean, again, I'm happy to say they loved their elementary years and great teachers. Um, and then when I became a parent of a middle school, it was like I was in a different district because I would go to those meetings and it would be, how can we help support your child? And have you, have you thought of a 504 plan? And I'm like, what? I tried to get a 504 plan and was told no, 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 no. So it was such a different, like I, it literally felt like a different school district and, um, and felt like academically my, my kids, uh, were supported and teachers made an effort to get to know, some of the teachers made an effort to get to know my children and administrations responded to some of our needs. However, I don't wanna be a Debbie Downer, but that was also a time where there wasn't a safe and affirming environment. And I don't know if as a parent, anyone has had to send their child to school knowing they were getting bullied and not feeling safe to share that with anyone at the school for fear of making it worse. And I hope that, I'm sorry, but um, that's the worst kind of pain a parent can feel because there's, you feel helpless and um, knowing that your child was scared but didn't want to say anything and knowing you really didn't really have at that point, I didn't feel like I had a lot of control. And it was so bad that we were actually looking at going to a different school because your child should not feel like they're unsafe or that they were getting bullied specifically because they were different. It's, it's just, it's just not okay, and I, I just have a, I have a hard time thinking that people didn't know what was going on other than the kids. So some kids didn't know, and nobody, I'm learning that a lot of people that are bullied do not want to tell anyone because there's some shame in that. And I think that that happens more than we might want to admit, especially at the middle school. And so I, I, I do want to just say that the high school is, again, like a different district. 
and uh, meetings have been welcoming and I felt included and that my voice mattered. I am not worried that my student, or that my student, that my, <laughs> that my child is, um, is not safe. And some of the individuals that were actually um, not kind are, have, have, have made turnarounds. And so I, I do believe that not to judge, like, um, I'm sorry. Dr. Eversley Bradley. Dr. Eversley Bradley. Bradford? Bradwell. Bradwell. I'm sorry. I should get your name right. But I, I do really appreciate that um, people shouldn't be judged by their worst day or by a bad day. And so I very much am so grateful that there are some, some kids that have not been judged. And I had to be careful not to judge the kids that weren't very nice as to their horrible or they'll, you know, because everyone needs to be able to have a second chance and to learn. And it was kind of a big lesson for me when I kind of found out this person had apologized and um, acknowledged that they, what they did was wrong. And so I just think that we can't just, because one person made a bad choice, because my kids are not perfect. I am not perfect. I'm gonna make mistakes, I'm, I, I'm human. And so to give people a chance to learn again, and I, and I do have to say that this is happening in the high school. And I'm so, I was so happy that there was some, I don't know actual name, but when somebody made a mistake and said a comment that was inappropriate, the way it was handled was not you were bad or that it was, tell me what happened. Tell me, you know, give, give, giving this person some ideas for what to do different and strategies for how to shut the conversation down and I appreciated that so much because I think it's a it's a way of acknowledging that people can make mistakes but it's also an opportunity for our students to learn and not walk away and go home with oh you know I screwed up and instead they they have an opportunity to learn how to do it differently the next time and so the, the other thing I want to just point out with regards to the middle school is I think it's a tough time. I could never teach that, po that, <laughs> that population, so kudos to, to uh, middle school <laughs> teachers. Kudos to every teacher um, right now. But I, I think that the one thing that I do want to share is that um, one of my kids was kind of pestered by um, a teacher to attend a lunch bunch because he was in the enrichment program and was, I don't know if harassed is the word, but it came to a point where he didn't really feel comfortable. And all he wanted to do was hang out with his friends. And it was during these conversations that I learned that all the enrichment students had their lockers together and I was, like, I didn't understand why that was the case, and I thought that I didn't want my son to be in a special locker area. I wanted him to be with his peers, and I had to make a special request to make sure that his locker was not, was not there. And, I, and it kind of made me question, like, why would you, put, would you put all the kids that were failing math, would you put their lockers together? Would you put, like, it, I, I'm, I still struggle with that decision, and I probably don't know all the information. Um, but, and I, and I did share with the counselor and the principal and even the superintendent that I didn't understand that, and I, and I thought that it supported, you know, separating and, and putting kids in groups that maybe they don't want to be in. Um, so I, I think that there were also a lot of opportunities where teachers reached out in Bay Trail to, to welcome me and affirm me. So with not, it's, it's not all bad, but I, 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 I'm not here to just say all the wonderful things. I'm also here to, to say that Penfield is working towards making change, and I, and I do appreciate that. I have other stories, but I want to make sure there is room and time for everyone to speak. So I, I just want to say thank you, and I, I do hope that this doesn't come back to my kids. So I'm, I'm sharing this in a space that is my experience. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you. 
So I am just noticing the time, so I wanted to invite the for Zephora, Zach, and Amy to share however much or as little as you need to share in the time, and if you want to. I would really like to share. <laughs> you should share. <laughs> um, I, and again, I really appreciate this space um, to be transparent as about my experience as a black student at um, Penfield in, in the Penfield School District. Um, and not only as a black person, as a black young woman in the Penfield Central School District. Um, and, and, and talk about um, the weight felt by students of color, particularly black students in Penfield Central School di District, and encourage pe parents, teachers, um, and administrators to, again, empathize with your students of color um, who are angry at a world who continues to attack them. I am angry <laughs> and I am frustrated and it gets increasingly hard to come to school and put on a brave face and say, I'm okay and you know, here's everything that's happening in my life when, when this world doesn't really seem to care or has, and historically has taught me that it hasn't mattered. Um, so I encourage you that with that being said, I, I would ask um, as my graduation parting gift <laughs> um, to be patient and empathize with your students who are angry and who are frustrated and who are emotional um, and to be patient with those, those students and, and create spaces and circles where your non-students of color can engage and create meaningful um, friendships and relationships with those who are struggling right now. Um, I will say that my experience in Penfield hasn't always been peachy keen and it hasn't always been um, terrible in middle school, however, this this one story will probably stay with me for the rest of my life. In seventh grade, we were learning about United States history, and with that, immediately you think of slavery, um, and you think of the, the impact of slavery in the construction of the United States. So my teacher, trying to, um, trying to stir conversation around that, she had a student activity. Um, now, I would like to preface by saying I was the only student of color in my class, only black girl in my class, and the activity that my teacher had us do was draw in slaves on a boat um, and color in shackles and then, and then, sorry, and then, sorry. Okay, Zephora, we got you. <clears throat> and then paint or color fields of cotton and the emotional damage that comes from that that I did not know what to do with. Is, is, is I will carry that for the rest of my life. Um, and that's, that's something that I feel is on that teacher. And I am blessed and fortunate to have educated parents who spoke up on my beca behalf. But not everyone has that, those advocates. So I beg you to be the advocate for that student and to speak up for the assignments that are just insensitive. and. I'm not gonna say stupid because I'm learning, but insensitive and, and have no place in an educational environment that is trying to be welcoming. Um, however, I will say that at my time at the high school, um, I, in pre preparation for Mamma Mia, um, and as the character Tanya in Mamma Mia, the director, Mrs. Darling, she wanted to talk to, my, talk to me about my hair um, and kind of create a costume. And um, this story ends well, so. <laughs> Um, she came up to me and she said, Zipporah, I do want to talk to you about your hair. And I'm nervous. I'm scared. Like, what do you mean, my hair? And she says, I want you to look professional, but whatever that means for you as a black woman. Whatever professional means for you as a black woman. And if you want to wear your hair natural, wear your hair natural in a big afro and, you know, share your curls. Um, and, you know, she gave me the parameters, but she also let me be a black woman in, a, in, in this space, or a black young woman in this space, and I will also never forget that. So I have a, um, I have a, a totem, I guess, of, of, both, of both sides and both, um, both feelings um, of the spectrum, and for the majority of my time, I will say that I felt welcomed and affirmed and included, um, and moving forward, I, my goal now is to reach out to um, young black students and with the BSU and with um, different opportunities throughout the school, I'm, I'm happy to do that so that they know that they are affirmed and welcomed in this environment.
Um, I would like to share, and I'll tell you what, I'll combine my three and four because I think- <laughs> I was gonna say, let's I, it, I take voracious notes. So like every time someone said something, I was like, oh yeah, that, that's how I would connect back. Um, but I'll, I'll try and keep this brief. Um, I wanted to pivot first off of what Justin said. Uh, and I don't, I don't remember if this was the exact word or the phrasing, but it came to my mind that I was um, welcomed and affirmed sort of by default, right? Like this space of a suburban school district with predominantly white attendees for a, a middle class young man who at the time, you know, identified as straight, uh, and cisgender, it, like, yes. It, I realized what I said at the beginning of tonight that I had such a great experience here that just sort of, you know, rose, uh, rose the consciousness again that I sort of forgot about. Like, I was welcomed and affirmed by default, right? Like, we have to keep that in mind. And that's not, I guess, a knock. Well, maybe it is a knock. Uh, but it's something I think that we can learn from, right? The other thing I wanted to keep, uh, circle back to um, related to my experience here, you know, so much of tonight has been about language. Um, and Jessica, you mentioned something that I wrote down this note. In terms of discriminatory or hurtful or prejudiced yeah. language, um, I again, uh, sorry for this, but I'll, I'll just say it as it is. I remember growing up in what I called the fag era. Everything was gay. I think Justin said this, I think other people, everything was gay. Everyone who no one liked was a fag and someone who deep down in, starting in sixth grade knew that I was attracted to other men and boys. Um, Like there was no way in the early and mid 2000s like that could ever be realized, at least in my mind. Um, so getting back to the language component, I, I, I came up with this. There were definitely teachers and faculty and staff that were either prohibitive, right? They would hear kids say things and interrupt and, and, and prevent it. Then there were other faculty and staff who would sort of just permit it, right? Wouldn't say anything. And then there were other ones who would participate. And not, not quite as overtly as, you know, teenagers and students can be very on, uh, on the nose about their language. But, you know, sort of taking part in the jokes. Or, you know, oh yeah, I wonder what you boys do after school. Like those kinds of things. And I thought, you know, maybe, maybe there has been, particularly in the LGBTQ space, a lot more acceptance and a lot more growth in the last 15 to 20 years. But I talked to some of my students at UB, many of whom are freshmen, right? Uh, I teach all four levels of undergrad. And I, you know, I'll talk and I'll talk and I'll share my stories with them, sometimes in office hours, and they'll say, yeah, it actually hasn't come as far as you think. Uh, and kids and young people, and I think maybe just society in general, whether we're talking race or ethnicity or sexual or gender identity, we see it very overtly. I know as Leah mentioned with transphobia right now, I think people have just gotten more aware they gotta be careful about hiding it, right? Mm -hmm. That there are spaces like locker rooms and hanging out with friends in certain closed off areas uh, in a hallway when you don't think an adult is around, or you don't think a student or a peer who might be of a marginalized community is within earshot, that then the sort of envelope is allowed to be peeled back. And I appreciated my students, again, in, in undergrad, telling me that and sort of having my little aha moment, like, wow, uh, in this case, Zach, maybe I am, maybe you are being a little naive. Um, so again, in, in hindsight, my experience on the whole at Penfield was very affirming and welcoming. But again, I, I was sort of given that ladder to affirmation and, and welcoming by default. Um, and the, the sort of baggage I carried around internally that I didn't really start to outwardly grapple with till I was in college um, I just, I think 
adults, whether it's parents, again, whether it's staff or faculty, those, those three Ps about prohibitive, permissive, or participatory. Like, where are you in that language sort of triangle? Um, so, yeah, that, those are, that's sort of my answers to three and four on the question sheet. Um, yeah. Amy? I think I'm just going to let Zach and Zipporah's words resonate. Okay. Um, I want to thank all of you for answering that question. Took an incredible amount of bravery um, to talk about the affirming experiences you've had and also the ones that have been incredibly challenging for you. And I would like for all of you to know that in this space, as Dr. Sean Eversley Bradwell said, that you are all seen, you are heard, and you are known. You're known. So for our closing round, we're going to go straight to our closing thoughts. Um, and if you could just share one thought or idea about an actionable item that we as members of the Penfield School community could collaboratively engage in as we work towards ensuring a welcoming and an affirming environment for all. One thought or idea. You might have more than one, but the one that's springing to mind. I'll let you percolate on it. You want to go down there, Carmen? All right, you look ready. Um, the very first thing that came to my mind, I guess, was um, taking it easy on yourself and also on other people. Um, I'm very thankful to my principal, uh, Mr. Nelson. He is very understanding um, to all of us teachers, and, and I can tell he genuinely um, there's so much that he's responsible for and he has to do and same with us too but he has just given at least I have perceived it as this true aura of like I'm trying to like not put too much on your plate and I really appreciate that um, and I try to do the same thing for my students as well and sometimes even if you don't tangibly feel the thing that is causing anxiety or maybe you don't even know that you have this anxiety or that the kids do um it usually is i'm i'm realizing now i'm like with everything that's happening so i would say taking it easy <laughs> what comes to mind for me is um is maintaining some context and uh this, this will be sort of a medium-sized bucket of cold water um we're talking we're all talking about language but what we're really talking about is is social justice and and racism and transphobia and, and sexism and everything and um <coughs> this is a really valuable conversation about language um but it's also the case that so for me for instance as a journalist i have thought a lot about and made the change between when I'm writing about slavery, saying a slave versus an enslaved person, and, and that's important. That also is not what prevents there from being hardly any affordable housing in Penfield. That's not what makes incarceration rates wildly disparate. That's not what keeps women paid less than men or suicide rates higher for LGBTQ kids than, than straight cisgender kids. I, and if everyone goes away from this important discussion about language and is all fired up and dedicates all of their energy to cleaning up language or policing language or whatever, and like that's your thing, then like in the context of racism, that's a big victory for the cause of white supremacy, to like focus all of your language on what words am I gonna use with other people. And, that, and to say it again, this is, this is important. I am happy to be here. I think a lot about this, and I really value what everybody's saying. Um, but there's also a lot more structural stuff to keep in mind at the same time. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I would uh, want 
everyone that I know in my community, whether in school in which I live, and what I ask teachers that I teach a lot of this work is really be thinking more about your circle and who you are with. Is everyone that you are around just like you? Because if so, you are not going to be able to create a welcoming and affirming environment for children like mine. You cannot possibly think that you know it or that you can do it if you are just in your bubble. And it really makes me think about what you're saying because the structural, the, the, the structural problems that we have in education and housing and all of those things are, are so um, embedded and, and we keep just going and operating within them. We have to look at our circle and you have to do something about changing yourself to be able to create that for our children. Um, you, you have to look at your circle and if everyone really is the exact same as you, you are the one that has to do the work, not my kid, not students. Uh, it, it really is just a, a plea that I'm putting out there because we can talk about the work, we can talk about what might be coming from the state, we can talk about maybe changing a book in the class, but if we're really not doing it ourselves, it's not authentic at all. It's not genuine and it's definitely not gonna create change. Yeah, I really agree with um, what you said and what Justin said. Um, like as allies, as people who may not be people of color, who may not be gay or who may not be like a minority group, like please use your power, use your pr privilege to like do something, um, just policing yourself, policing your friends in private, like doing something to change the system as much as you can because only when we as a community are all like on the same page and together about wanting to make the world a more affirming place for everyone can we get change i think we can put like like you can put stickers on a trash can and be like oh look see we're using the right word look we have a little flag aren't we doing so good but at the end of the day you have to throw the trash out and i think massive changes in the world need to be made. I mean, this isn't just about like the district, um, but just like, yeah, like being performative versus really making steps to help people that you know and to help like the whole issue. I'll just say ditto to what has been said. Um, have more of these kinds of events and maybe someday this will be a full filled auditorium with more curious <laughs> individuals that want to learn so i also want to encourage the district to support our teachers in learning more how to do this and how to support all of our students of all abilities race gender language religion if our teachers feel comfortable and are supported, then our kids will also feel that way. So invest in our teachers' ability to learn and even as parents to just stay curious. We don't, we don't know everything. Um, again, ditto to everything that's been said before me. I think I would add um, to, to not hold one story accountable to the stories of all. Um, whether that be the religion that they represent or that they are a part of, um, the race that they are a part of, um, pri pr primarily for um, students of color, again. Um, my story isn't the same as my peers' story. Um, and the people who are younger than me are having different experiences than I am right now. Um, so it, it's, it's a, a struggle to kind of detach and eliminate stereotypes and just see people for who they are and as an individual and unique and, and created to serve their own individual purpose. 
Um, but that would be my affirming um, goal moving forward. Um, the goal I think about, I, I will admit I don't have a magic wand or know how it necessarily manifests, but I think continuing to have conversations and sessions and meetings like this and um, trying to reach the people who aren't here tonight, right? Like all of you, I'm assuming, elected to come here. So the people or those who, you know, might have a, a farther runway to grow upon um, are oftentimes the ones most hesitant to show up to things like these. But um, I know there are certain people in this room that are probably sick of hearing me say this, but there's a thing called good discomfort. And uh, there's nothing wrong with being a little uncomfortable. And if this district continues to do all the good work it's been doing, you know, you, you can find ways, I don't know how, but I know it can be done, uh, to, to pull in the people who might be the most discomfort avoidant. So again, that's not really a tangible, uh, nice and neat with a bow on it goal, but I think it's a goal. I'll just pop in and say then I can't help myself. I, I love that expression to sit in the discomfort. And I think that just asking us to do that, not just have our students do that, but us living that is so important. Um, like some of the other members here shared, I grew up in Fairport. I'm a white, suburban, heterosexual, cisgender woman. And my experience was great. I, I understood, I did well in school. Everything was you know, fine. Um, so to be able to sit in the discomfort and, and pain really and, and sorrow of hearing other people's stories is incredibly illuminating, but it, it, it involves being a little uncomfortable and that's hard for us all to do. So thank you for making that statement. All right, so we had planned t time to take your questions, but we really wanted to center the stories that were being said and not interrupt your flow. So we do have district representatives coming around to collect your burning question cards. Um, if you have those, let us know and someone will come and collect them. We won't have time, unfortunately, to answer those tonight, but um, I did just get word that the questions and answers will be posted on the district website, so we'll have time for that. Um, in terms of our time here, I wanted to thank each of our panelists for sharing your time with us, for sharing this space in community building, for being brave with your thoughts and your reflections. Um, especially to our students, really. Shout out to our students, thank you. And I, I did want to acknowledge that often these conversations are just the beginning, the beginning part of a journey. Um, I feel very lucky to be able to do this work in many districts, and I want to acknowledge that sometimes these conversations can be very difficult, for, especially for those of us who've experienced harm or trauma. Listening to these stories, repeating these stories for ourselves can often be re-triggering or re-traumatizing and exhausting. So I hope that all of us here who are bearing witness to this can be gracious with ourselves on this journey of learning and connection, that you can seek the support that you need where you need it, and that you can pour back into yourself. We're all holding so much coming into this space. Sometimes after we have these conversations, we are still listening, we're still processing, we're all on our journey of processing. Um, if you do have other questions, we have district representatives here, Ms. Potter is here to answer questions now or to email later. Um, and if you do need some processing time, even with me, I can make myself available afterwards. I hope that we can continue to keep this important conversation going. I hope to see you all back again in the future like with more people, as we mentioned. And I hope that you can continue to share your stories and continue to hold space for stories. I'm gonna leave you with one of my favorite quotes around storytelling before I say good night and hope you have a good evening. And this one comes to us from Terry Tempest Williams, who's an uh, environmental activist. She says, story is the umbilical cord that connects us to the past, to the present, and to the future. It's our family. Story is a relationship between the teller and the listener. It's a responsibility. Story is an affirmation of our ties to one another. Thanks for hearing all the stories tonight. Take good care of yourselves and have a good evening.